Okay, even if you are not all settled down, we are going to start because we don't have, uh, we don't have all that much time. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment. I am Marina Ottaway, and uh, I am the director of the Middle East uh, program here. Uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, the, uh, we have uh, come to the conclusion that it's becoming increasingly difficult to talk about uh, the Middle East without also uh, extending the discussion, not only obviously to Iraq, which we never excluded, but also a bit more to, uh, uh, the, uh, to Kurdistan and therefore the relationship with Turkey. And we are very glad to have with us as a non-resident associate, Henri Barki, who has been helping us, in fact, broadening the scope of the work we have been uh, doing. Uh, I will keep the introductions to a minimum. Uh, 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 the, since you have the, uh, uh, since we have the uh, uh, the, uh, the bios of all the participants in front of you, let me just uh, uh, very briefly, Henri Barki, as I said, is a non-resident associate at Carnegie, which for us it's the most important of of, co of course of his positions. He's also sort of secondarily, he's also a professor in, uh, at Lehigh University and the chair of the International Relations. Department. Uh, Kubat Talabani is going to bring a different perspective to this issue, coming as he's a representative of the Kurdistan regional government, has been very deeply involved both in uh, uh, first uh, in Iraq or in Kurdistan and now here in the unfolding of uh, the story. And finally, Ian Lesser who is a senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund. And uh, particularly importantly for this project, he has been leading a major project on the future of US-Turkish relations at the Woodrow Wilson Center before joining the transatlantic, uh, uh, the, be, before uh, joining the, uh, uh, the, the German Marshall Fund. So let me, uh, uh, without further ado, let me give the floor to Henri Barki who will speak for about 15 minutes, and uh, the discussants will have about 10 minutes later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marina. OK. Uh, uh, I want you to know that at Lehigh also, I told them that my primary responsibility is at Carnegie and not at Lehigh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll see my paycheck this year, well, this month. Um, the, let me just say um, very quickly what this report is about. Most of the details, um, the devil is of course in the, is in the details and we probably won't have that much time to go into the details and you have the, um, the, the report and you can read it obviously at your leisure. But the, the, the two things that this report tries to, uh, the two main ideas in this report and its implementation has to do with the fact that as the United States, especially under the presidency of Barack Obama, starts to think about disengaging from Iraq over a certain period of time, it should not take the Kurdish issue for granted. Uh, this has a possibility of creating, becoming a major spoiler in US, uh, U.S. plans. But the other main idea here is that one of the results of the 2003 invasion of Iraq has been to give an additional boost, if you want, to Kurdish nationalism in the region and to uh, nationalist, I mean, to, to Kurds in all four countries where they reside, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and, and Iran. And whether we like it or not, this is, this is a fact. And the, and the issue here is that um, events in one, as, one part, especially, of, uh, of this region in Iraq tend to affect uh, all the others. So the other point that this report is trying to uh, make is that instead of our traditional way at, in, in the United States of looking at the Kurdish question as a, uh, a piecemeal or from a country-specific uh, perspective, that maybe there is a way of thinking about this in a, in a much more general and unified way because we cannot um, uh, separate its, its, different, its different components. Um, 
clearly the most important result of the 2003 invasion was the, cre the creation of a federal Iraqi state. Now, those, those, most of you know the Middle East better than I do in some respects, and to have a federal state in, in the Middle East is quite revolutionary. That doesn't mean that this federal state has consolidated itself. It, this doesn't mean that the federal state, we, we still don't know the future, but clearly this is one of the major developments. And to the extent that the Kurdistan regional government is now recognized constitutionally uh, within Iraq, and Kurdish, Kurdish is the second language, you can even think of Iraq now as a, almost as a binational state. And this has consequences, obviously, for, for, for the region. But from an American perspective, the, 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 the most important uh, and the first priority is is how do we manage, as we pull out, how do we manage the Kurdish federal region uh, in, in, in northern Iraq? Primarily because, as uh, the reports and everybody knows, uh, suggest that the relationship between the KRG and Baghdad has not been completely solidified. There are still major issues, the most important one of which is what to do with the disputed territories. And I should say that the disputed territories that people mostly focus on Kirkuk is only one part of it. There's Kirkuk the city, there's Kirkuk the province, or Tamim as Saddam re renamed it. But if you look at the map that's, in, that's provided in, in this report, the disputed territories actually extend quite, quite a bit, and they go above Mosul all the way to the Syrian border in Sinjar, to Hanakin and below on the ir Iranian border. So we're talking about a fairly significant piece of, uh, piece of territory. And... Um, from, as the United States disengages from, from, uh, from Iraq, the last thing it wants to, to see is, is conflict ov uh, over the future of, of northern Iraq, of the KRG, and what to do with these disputed ter territories. Now, let me just, before I go into more details, and what I will focus mostly here is um, uh, policy uh, prescriptions for the new administration to the extent that I have the audacity, so to say, uh, to quote somebody, to suggest it to them. But um, there are three aspects to the Kurdish problem that potentially can create um, a violent conflict. Obviously, the most important is the future boundaries, as I intimated, uh, yeah, with respect to the KRG. Um, Together with that, obviously, is also the resolution of the oil-rich uh, and oil resources. And remember that within, as part of the constitution of Iraq, the central government and the KRG had agreed, essentially, to have a referendum in Kirkuk by the end of 2007. And we are now a year and a, few, and a month and a half almost since the end of that deadline. And the, and the referendum has been postponed now uh, over a certain, uh, well over a year. And it doesn't look like it's going to be um, implemented anytime soon. For one thing, it's not just a referendum that has to be in, uh, done, but it's the normalization of Kirkuk. And the normalization of Kirkuk involves not only the, uh, the, ret the return of uh, all refugees from Kirkuk, that is to say not just Kurds, but Turkomans and anybody else who were, who were um, uh, cleansed, if you want, by Saddam Hussein. The removal of um, the, the people that Saddam brought to, uh, to that part of uh, Iraq, but also most importantly, the, re, um, the back or the reverse gerrymandering of the province of Kirkuk. Saddam had taken uh, parts of Kirkuk that were heavily Turkoman or heavily, um, or Turkmen, as I use it in, in, this, in the report, Turkmen or Kurdish, and taken them out of uh, that region to make it more Arab so that they, they would not be uh, secessionist or um, demands on, on Kirkuk. So that has to be reversed. And once you've done this, you have to have a census, and after the census, you can, you know, that's only then that you can have a, a, a referendum. And you can see that the, uh, these issues are still very much alive, given the fact that we had provincial elections this past Sunday in, um, uh, not this Sunday, Sunday before, in, in Iraq, and in the provincial elections, certain parts of the country did not participate, and Kirkuk was one of the areas that did not participate precisely because of the, 
sensitivity of this, uh, of this thing. And in Kirkuk, you have obviously not just the Arab uh, Kurdish dimension, but you also have uh, the Turkmen Kurdish uh, problem within the city of Kirkuk. But the, the, the danger of Kirkuk is that it can spill over to other parts of, uh, northern, uh, of northern Iraq, not just the Kurdish areas, but into cities like Mosul, which is uh, primarily majority Arab, but has large uh, Kurdish populations, um, in, and also Nineveh province. And I think the, the, you, the election results, I haven't seen the detailed breakdown yet, but show that there is already... Um, uh, in Nineveh province, which Mosul belongs to, um, uh, has been won by essentially a very anti-Kurdish uh, Sunni party. So that's one, one problem. The other problem, of course, is the relationship between the KRG and Turkey. Um, for a long time, those, that relationship uh, was uh, very fractured. The Turks tried very hard to prevent the creation of a, uh, of a federal Iraq, and what they don't want now is obviously for, for northern Iraq to go independent and certainly for Kirkuk not to become part of, um, of the KRG for the simple reason that if Kirkuk becomes part of, uh, of the KRG, then Kirkuk will have oil resources and therefore uh, it will be able to secede. This is also a fear that uh, the rest of Iraq uh, has a bad. But the problem with, um, with the KRG is not simply the, the fact that um, it's not just the issue of Kirkuk, but it is also the fact of the demonstration effect it has on the Kurds of, of southeastern Turkey. And there's no question that when you look at the politics of uh, Turkish Kurds, there has been a degree, if you want, of self-confidence uh, after, as, as northern Iraq has become more solidified and, and more independent, if you want. But there is also the problem of the PKK, which is partially based in Turkey and partially based in, uh, this is the Kurdistan Workers' Party in northern Iraq. And for a long time, th um, the presence of the PKK was a major sore point between the United States and, and, and Turkey because uh, the Turks... Uh, pointed out that uh, they had legally the right to uh, to intervene in northern Iraq because uh, people were, were coming from northern Iraq and attacking Turkish targets, and the United States did not want to upset the, the delicate balance in the north. But this seems to be at least uh, has been resolved to some extent starting in December 2007 when the United States gave a green light to the Turks to start doing um, uh, cross-border incursion, mostly by aircraft through targeted bombings with intelligence that the United States also has, uh, has given the Turks. But this northern Iraq still remains as, as a flashpoint. And in many respects, northern Iraq is, has become, in a Turkish imagination, uh, the one major problem between the United States uh, and Turkey, because many people in, Turk in Turkey do genuinely believe that the United States went to war in Iraq um, for one and one purpose only, and that is to create a Kurdish state in northern Iraq and maybe a Kurdish state in, in, um, in, um, in, um, in Turkey itself. So you have a great deal of, uh, um, of um, uh, uncertainty, not a lack of trust, if you want, between the Turkey and the United States, even though there is, a, there, there is now there's been a rapprochement. Part of the answer to, to this is to get the KRG and the Turks to cooperate more. And it's interesting, when I started writing the report, and of course it has nothing to do with the report, and I started a long time ago, um, relations between the KRG and Turkey were quite difficult. And since then, there's been a great deal of improvement. There is now, the, the, there's been a change in, in Turkey, at least in the, government, in the government and also within the military, that they that they should deal with the KRG. Until recently, the, they did not uh, want even, to, they don't recognize the KRG still to this day, but they didn't want even to talk to the KRG. But that has changed, and there's a great deal more cooperation between the KRG and, and Turkey, and this is actually one of the best, shall we say, the most positive pa parts of the story. Finally, Iran and Syria, and this is the least, uh, foc the part I least focus on in, uh, in the report, Iran and Syria are very worried about northern Iraq. Um, they're worried for the obvious reasons that their own Kurdish populations are also getting um, 
uh, incited, if you want, by the presence of, by, by northern Iraq uh, and the, the achievements that northern Iraq has, has, um, ha has made. And there has been events in, in Syria uh, where Kurds have rebelled, where Kurd, I mean, have demonstrated, I should say, rebelled is probably too, too. So in, in Iran, you do have uh, the PKK offshoot, the Iranian offshoot of the PKK, PJAK, which is based in northern Iraq, which um, uh, has, uh, has used Iraqi territory to attack Iran. But there's a great deal of unhappiness among Ira Iranian Kurds. So what is it that the United States needs to think, how does the United States need to think and what its priorities should be? Clearly, for the United States, the most important priority is maintaining the, um, the territorial integrity of Iraq. And to do that, how do you get there? It seems to me that the provincial election results of last week may show that there is more of a tendency now for a recentralization re of um, Iraqi politics and Iraqi society. But I would argue that um, the best possible solution for, for Iraq is for that federal structure, and we, the boundary is, is something we can discuss later, for, for that federal structure to be really uh, consolidated. Because without the consolidation of the federal, uh, that federal structure, then you will have um, uh, the, the tendency of Kurds to go for secession. You have to remember that the Kurds have been running their territory since 1991. So for all intents and purposes, for 18 years now, they have been independent. Yes, conditions have not always been great in northern Iraq. Sometimes the PUK and the KDP, the two main parties, have fought with each other. But nonetheless, there is now not much of a memory of central Iraqi government control in, in northern Iraq, in education, in all whole variety of, uh, of um, structures. So trying to, um, as the United States thinks of leaving, it has to make sure, and I go into the details of what the United States can do in, in northern Iraq, of consolidating uh, the n northern Iraq. Number two, it has to uh, improve Turkish KRG relations. As I said, this has started, but it is always hostage to domestic politics, whether in, in northern Iraq or in, in Turkey, and it is, I think, United States engagement to which to this day hasn't really happened um, to make sure that Turkey and the KRG continue to cooperate. Both sides have a great deal to gain. The only exit for the KRG is Turkey in, if, into the modern world. If, if you ask, the, you can ask Kubat after all. If you, um, if you ask the, the Kurds what choice do they want in terms of exit, is it Turkey, Syria, or Iran, or the rest of Iraq, they will all tell you that it, it's Turkey. Turkey is a country that is actually closest in many respects to the, to the Kurds, who are much more secular than the rest of Iraq and, um, and certainly Iran. But also, um, in terms of trade, Turkish economy is far more advanced. Turkish economy is closer to Europe. To Europe. Uh, for all these reasons, it's, it is important. But for the Turks as well, I mean, the, the KRG actually, the, the Turks have always looked at the KRG as a potential um, uh, hostile area. But in fact, it can be rev that, that approach can be reversed. Yes, I'm not saying that Kurds and Turks love each other and that there is a great deal of, uh, but there, is, there are a lot of, commercial interactions uh, uh, bet between the two sides, and that has created a bond. And most importantly, politically, Turkish Kurds do look to northern Iraq as a potential area uh, uh, which they are very proud of. And it is a place that can, if uh, it, it actually help enhances their, their, their identity as Kurds, but also it reduces necessarily their in uh, the desire to have a separate Kurdish state. But there are, there are unquestionably problems in Turkey, which I will get to in a minute. So that's number two. Number three, and critical to this second step, is to the demilitarization of the PKK. The PKK has remained in northern Iraq, in part in areas that are quite inaccessible to, um, to the KRG forces, and the United States has done no, nothing to, to, re, to remove them, in part because it cannot afford to, to send troops there. That said, there is a way to demilitarize the, the KRG, which I go into, in, in, and that's a very important way of removing, from a Turkish perspective, the single greatest hindrance 
to KRG Turkish rapprochement because the Turks have been very suspicious of the KRG's approach to, uh, until recently, I should say, um, to, to the PKK. And I think now they're starting to be convinced that both uh, uh, the KRG President Barzani and the Iraqi President Talabani are serious about doing something about uh, the PKK. But the truth is, the, even the PKK issue, can, I don't think, can be resol- cannot be resolved without U.S. In- inter- intercession. Um, so, um, finally, the two points I would like to make before she stops me. Um, the Turkish-Kurdish question, ultimately, I would say, is the 800-pound gorilla in, in, this, in this issue. Why? Because Turkey, for the United States, is the single most important country in the region. Turkey is, as you know, the NATO, NATO. Turkey is a country that is trying to become a member of the European Union. And until and, and unless it does resolve this issue of its own domestic Kurds, the Europeans are going to find it uh, find reasons not to let the Turks in because for them this is actually a very critical critical issue. So helping resolve the Turkish Kurdish uh, question is um, is important. I am not saying that not, we can do it, and I'm not saying that this is an easy. It is in many ways it's the most difficult part. But there are things that we can do from as I said earlier in terms of helping demilitarize the PKK to um, to help through NGOs and non. Um, Track to diplomacy, help uh, bring uh, the two sides in Turkey together. Uh, but again, the details are. Finally, on Syria and Iran, I mean, the one thing, one of the um, fears, of course, after 2003 uh, in Iran and Syria was that, uh, in the words of uh, the former uh, uh, John, Bolt, John Bolton, was take a number, if you remember what he said about Iran and Syria, that they were going to be next after we clean up Iraq. Well, first of all, life hasn't turned out to be that way, but the, both the Iranians and Syrians, um, and especially the Iranians, to uh, fear that we are actually going to be using, or actually are using, if you believe Sima Hirsch, uh, the, Iraqi, the Iranian Kurds as a potential destabilizing element in Iran. Now, President Obama has, uh, is talking about a completely new approach, uh, but I'll, I also suggest that it is important to send a clear message to the Iranians and the Syrians that we are not interested in fanning the, uh, the flames of Kurdish nationalism all over the region, not in Turkey, not, we, we want a legitimate solu- uh, resolution of the problems, but we are not about to, we're not thinking about using the KRG in Northern Iraq as a means of undermining both of these regimes. And uh, finally, in terms of implementation, and remember, I mean, you will see that when you read the report that I talk about this rest- somewhat the restructuring of policy making in uh, the State Department at the NSC with respect to this. And of course, I wrote this before, um, <laughs> No, not only that, not before yesterday, before there was this proliferation of special envoys. Um, and one of the things I do recommend is not necessarily a special envoy, but some kind of uh, coordinator, because it, politically thinking, when you know, Turkey is part of Europe, so European folks deal with Turkey, uh, the European uh, command, uh, military command deals with Turkey, but Iraq and Iran obviously are under NEA or, uh, or, or CENTCOM. And, Sometimes getting our part of the different parts of our government to to talk to each other is more difficult than getting, the, let's say, the KRG and the Turks to talk to each other. You can actually sit, look at this table. You have people from the Turkish embassy and the KRG at the same table. But but getting Sencom and Sencom and you come together in that sense. So part of what I was I was recommending was this. Uh, and, uh, a, a special coordinator, but I, of course I suspect this is not going to be uh, very well viewed. But I, the other thing that occurred to me uh, again yesterday was that maybe Dennis Ross can do it since um, he needs more than Iran to be able to be acceptable to, to, to the Iranians. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for not having to be interrupted. <laughs> okay, but please. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks to the Carnegie Endowment for putting this event together and for um, putting this great report together, and congratulations to the author. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
I'll keep my remarks short um, so we can have a more engaging Q&A. But the, the issues that, that Henri has outlined in, in, in this report are all very critical to um, the viability of the, of the Iraqi state. Uh, and in particular for the U.S. administration as it tries to develop a, a, a sound policy for Iraq. We, we hope that the U.S. will, will treat Iraq um, in a more strategic way and deal with Iraq in a more strategic way as it has done um, in the past. If it wants to get out of Iraq quietly, peacefully, and if it wants to leave behind an Iraq that is functioning and stable, then several of the, the issues that, that is outlined in this report must be addressed. Um, those include the resolution of the disputed territories um, in Iraq, of which Kirkuk uh, as a province is, is one of them. Um, there has to be the development of a sound natural resources policy. Uh, it's not just about um, agreeing on a hydrocarbons law and on a revenue sharing law, but it's actual, the actual implementation of this law, the actual distribution of, of revenues in a fair and equitable way um, to all people of the country, to the regions, to the provinces, in a, in a transparent way that, that gives people in the region the trust that the federal government in, in Baghdad is actually functioning. Um, this comes to, I, I think, the, the next point, which is the implementation of federalism uh, and moving beyond this, this abstract concept that federalism is to, to most people in, in my part of the world, to actual something tangible and physical that, that is implemented that people begin to see its institutional structures uh, and begins to govern the country in accordance to, to law and, and, and to applying the rule of law uh, in Iraq, not just the rule of a personality that holds a powerful position in the country and makes decisions alone on behalf of that country. Uh, and and uh, again, we, we are strongly believe in improving the relationships between the Kurdistan regional government and Turkey. And I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, if you look back one year ago today, um, there was uh, 100,000 Turkish troops amassed on our border. In fact, this may have been the, the launch of, of one of um, the incursions into the Kurdistan region uh, a year ago today. And the relationship was, was, was in a very dire situation. Thankfully, um, the situation is a lot better now. There is uh, an improved level of dialogue between the two sides. Um, the discussions are, are ongoing, and the atmosphere is a lot better. We still have a long way to go, um, but I think the U.S. Um, should be uh, cognizant of this fact that, that the better the relationship between Turkey and the Kurdistan region, the, the more stable Iraq is going to be, the more greater peace of mind um, is going to be within the United States. Uh, and I think that it has to be in the U.S.'s strategic regional interests for there to be a strong relationship between Turkey and the Kurdistan region of Iraq. We understand that, and, and that's why we have forged ahead um, with, with our dialogue, with the development of the talks, and, and we're hoping that, that this um, development will, will continue. I, I chuckled as I read the, the report when, when Henri talks about the um, interagency issues and, and the, the, the fact of the EUR Bureau and the NEA Bureau. And as somebody that for nine years has tried to navigate that bureaucracy, it really did hit home. Um, because these bureaus rarely talk to each other, they all communicate up to their chain of commands. And, and by the time it gets to the undersecretary level, it's the, the, a lot of points are missed. So we would strongly welcome a special coordinator um, for these issues that, that would have um, senior level access to the Secretary of State or to the President. Um, we don't care if it's called an envoy or a representative or a rapporteur, what, whatever it can be called. Um, but to have some sort of focal point that can deal with these issues, again, on a strategic level, because the issues are vast. There are many different issues. There is the, the politics of Baghdad and the, the implementation of, of, a federal, of, of a federal system in the country. There are some technical issues um, which have strong political components, such as the resolution of the disputed territories. And then you have some things that have broad economic um, influences on the country, which is the sound natural resource policy for the country. These, these cannot be addressed um, ad hoc um, they have to be thought of in, in a more strategic way, and I think to have a focal point in the U.S. government um, to try to address these issues will be that um, strategic way of thinking uh, and, and uh, finding a way of um, addressing these problems. Each one of those issues, if left unresolved, could potentially destabilize Iraq. Um, each one of them is as important as the other, 
Um, and I think uh, th this administration would be wise to, to look into this in, in a very clear uh, and concise way. Um, this cannot just be kicked down the road now. Every year that, that we do not resolve the issue of the disputed territories, tensions raise, um, uh, the, the tensions are exacerbated, and enemies of the state are able to manipulate the tensions that, that are exacerbated. Um, every year that Iraq does not develop a sound natural resources policy, the country as a whole suffers, um, but again, resentment r raises. Um, a lot of people have criticized the Kurdistan regional government for entering into production sharing agreements with international oil companies. Um, but now it is clear that what we have done is actually beneficial to Iraq. Iraq has invested $8 billion in the infrastructure of its oil resources, yet production has declined. This is unacceptable. This has to be unacceptable. Um, it's certainly unacceptable to us. Through our efforts in, in signing these production sharing agreements, we're hoping to boost production of Iraqi oil. And now that the, the, the price of oil in the market is nowhere near what it was a year ago, I, I think there is going to be a greater tendency and a greater urgency coming out of Baghdad to find a resolution um, to this issue. Um, so each, each one of these issues are, are important. Um, we, we stand committed as the Kurdistan regional government to work with the U.S., to work with our partners in Baghdad um, to resolve these issues. We stay committed to, to working with, with our neighbors, in particular Turkey, um, to, to improve and build on um, the environment that has been created to actually develop tangible policies that will lead to, to lasting peace. And, and more importantly, we are certainly committed to, to the title of this um, publication, which is Preventing Conflict Over Kurdistan, because we have seen too much conflict. We have had our fair share of conflict, our internal and international conflicts. Um, and we are now at a point where, where we're developing our infrastructure we're developing our economy, we're developing our institutions of government in the Kurdistan region, and it is something that, that we are certainly proud of. We're hopeful that the United States should be proud of it because of your contribution to, to our development, and we're hopeful that Turkey is in fact proud of it because Turkey and Turkish companies do make up the majority of the investment in the Kurdistan region. There are over 700 Turkish companies today operating in Iraqi Kurdistan, whereas there are only nearly, probably around 40 American companies um, in, in the north. So there is um, benefit to all sides in a prosperous and stable Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, we are the most democratic force in the country. We do need to develop our democratic institutions. And I think, again, what, what is in this report is welcomed by the Kurdistan region when it talks about an elevated U.S. presence in, in the Kurdistan region. The regional reconstruction team that is there today are doing a fantastic job with very little resources, but elevating that kind of presence to a more traditional consular type um, representation will not only be beneficial to, to, to the U.S., and especially with, if it has a strong commercial office, to attracting investment in, in the Kurdistan region, but it can also be helpful to us as we develop our um, civil society as we develop our institutions where we can work with the various different NGOs and, and take the kind of expert advice that we can get on issues such as transparency, the rule of law, and, and, and good governance. Um, so I, I, I commend um, the, the Carnegie Endowment for, for this effort, and, and we stand ready to, to assist anyone that wants to help us to, to get to where we want to be, which is to live in peace and prosperity and, and live with our neighbors and, and live with each other. But we do have major and significant challenges that do require um, significant external um, involvement and engagement. And I'll end my remarks there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Marina, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, let me just uh, again add my congratulations to Henri and to uh, the Carnegie Endowment for the report, uh, for, for choosing the issue, for the analysis, uh, and for the recommendations, um, which I found really right, right on the money. Um, let me just make a couple of observations to follow on what's already been said, uh, really in three areas. Um, first, on this question of the meaning for Turkey specifically. Uh, secondly, on... Uh, Turkey-KRG relations, and then finally on the EU-US strategy piece of this. Um, on the internal side, I mean, I share Henri's assessment absolutely that this, this question of how Turkey deals with its own Kurdish issue, how it deals with it across the border, is absolutely a bellwether in terms of Turkey's evolution. 
uh, in many, many ways, socially, politically, in terms of its foreign policy. Uh, not only is it, is it interwoven in Turkey's own debate and action, but also in how others will see Turkey as well. Uh, there's clearly been a cycle, which Henri talks about very accurately in the report. Uh, at a certain phase over the decades, this is the situation inside Turkey on the Kurdish issue has actually been very bad. Um, and I, I think many Turks would acknowledge that, uh, and many Kurds in Turkey would acknowledge that. Um, there has been a fairly dramatic improvement recently, whether it extends into the kind of geopolitical and strategic realm, or it remains confined to the cultural realm, it remains to be seen. But, I mean, there has been a tremendous expansion of broadcasting and Kurdish language and so on. Um, and I'd be interested in, in your thoughts about how significant that really is and how it's seen across across the border, but people are taking note of that. I think one of the quite interesting things, remarkable things really, about this very difficult problem in Turkey, challenge over the last decades, um, is that it, it doesn't ever seem to have acquired a true intercommunal character. There has been tremendous violence. There's been tremendous uh, unrest, unhappiness, dislocation, uh, human rights issues, all the rest of it. But what, one thing you've really not seen in recent decades, anyway, in Turkey has been violence between Kurdish communities and Turkish communities over issues of identity, per se. Uh, le I'm leaving aside here the PKK phenomenon, which is, is obviously quite different. Uh, but in neighborhoods in Istanbul, you, you know, you really don't see this. One of the things I think uh, Turks do worry about um, is that uh, conditions... Um, could uh, go back again to something much worse, uh, to the kind of violence the Turks saw in the mid-1990s, that could, under these circumstances today, with higher nationalism, feelings of nationalism, and so on, in Turkey, in the region, produce that kind of intercommunal violence. I don't predict that at all. But I think it's one of the pieces of this that leads to a, a sort of the Turkish stake, which is really very high. The economic piece of this, I think, is also very very remarkable along the lines that you've just mentioned. I mean, Turkey's really very dominant position in, in terms of investment and, and trade with northern Iraq, which is acquiring very important, uh, not only national, but very specific regional implications inside Turkey. I was just in <coughs> Gaziantep a few weeks ago, and f some of you may be familiar with this, but Gaziantep is one of the cities in, in Turkey that is very well known for its sort of entrepreneurial culture and its small and medium-sized enterprises and its export-driven economy and so on, um, they have a very high percentage of their trade uh, with Syria, but in particular with, uh, with Iraq and northern Iraq. They're very close, not very far away. The truck traffic is very heavy and so on. So there is this, this interdependence and a real acknowledgement of it uh, when you talk to people in Gaziantep. Now, I think this takes on some even more important meaning when you think about the ec effects of the economic crisis, which are be beginning to be felt very strongly in Turkey. Uh, the point was made to me by several people, uh, and it sounds right, that uh, at a time when Turkey as a whole is suffering a shrinkage of its export markets, mainly to Europe, uh, these markets in the Middle East become even more important. And if that goes on for some years, as I'm afraid it probably will, um, in terms of the global crisis, uh, many other kinds of ties, cultural, political, and so on, could be reinforced. And, and it's worth thinking through the meaning, the meaning of that. My second point would be on the, on the uh, Turkish KRG relationship. Um, and I think Henri captures these dynamics very well in the report, and they've been elaborated on here. Let me just mention a couple of other things. <clears throat> in terms of Turkey's own perception, the depth of this suspicion about Western policy, anxiety over what might happen across the border, and anxiety about uh, Kurdish separatism and potentially irredentism. I, I don't say that's necessarily a real fear, but the fear is very real in Turkey. Um, the suspicion of the kind of role the West is playing in that has clearly grown <coughs> over the years. It's not new. Um, I, would, I would just underscore that this is not just public opinion, although public opinion counts in Turkey. It's also among elites. Uh, who really are genuinely suspicious of American policy uh, towards this issue, um, even as far as imagining that somehow the United States would countenance, uh, you know, uh, separatism on Turkish territory. Why we would want that for a NATO ally, it's, it's impossible to fathom. But people who should know better will sometimes make this argument. So this problem of suspicion 
And linked to it, I think Henri's very important point about the importance of second track diplomacy beyond just government to government uh, discourse to try to get at some of that uh, is absolutely critical, but it's a big issue, especially in, as nationalism is, is growing. Uh, some at, before the most recent PKK upsurge in PKK violence, there was a debate that was growing in Turkey about whether perhaps Turkey in some way could strategically live with an independent Kurdistan. Um, there was a fairly open debate about this at a certain point among the strategic class in Turkey. It's, it stopped after a certain point. But um, people were seriously talking about this, not only in terms of the economic relationship, but you know, just simply perhaps if this was going to come in some fashion, or at least an increasingly autonomous uh, Kurdish region in Iraq, perhaps Turkey could not only live with that, but somehow find a way to take advantage of it. Uh, this is not a mainstream view by any means, but the fact that you have had debates that started about this in Turkey is, I think, quite telling. Um, on the PKK, um, I, again, I think it's important to underscore just how, how searing an experience uh, PKK violence, especially in the 1990s, was for the Turkish public and Turkish elites. I mean, something like perhaps 40,000, we can debate the numbers, but they were very high, uh, individuals on all sides were killed in the 1990s as a result of the insurgency and the counterinsurgency and so on. This really was a searing experience, and there was always behind this the potential for something that would more closely resemble urban terrorism in Turkey um, as an offshoot of the PKK phenomenon. Now, that never really did get going, but it could under other circumstances. And so I think when one starts to think through strategies for either containing or uh, dis or, or demobilizing, whatever the term you choose might be, for the PKK, you have to sort of think that, you know, you may not solve the whole problem. There may be, you know, a, a real PKK out there, or however they may turn themselves, who will carry on the fight in other ways and keep this thing going. Finally, uh, my last point is on the European Union and the U.S. Um, you know, again, I think Henri gets this exactly right. Uh, as far as Turkey's own actually troubled uh, European Union candidacy is concerned, uh, whatever that relationship looks like in 10 or 15 years' time, and it is that kind of time frame, um, this issue is going to be quite central, uh, not only in terms of its, its role as a marker of where Turkey is in terms of internal liberalization, but also in terms of Europe's sort of cost-benefit analysis of what it means to have Turkey as a member. Uh, an unstable <coughs> Iraq, an unstable northern Iraq, a continuing insurgency and counterinsurgency is not, these are not the kind of conditions that a Europe already skeptical about Turkish membership is going to want to see. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an important stake for Turkey, for Europe, for the U.S. Uh, to manage this. Um, can the U.S. do the kinds of things that Henri um, identifies uh, and be trusted in doing them. Um, it's a somewhat separate question, and it ties into the broader issue of how the U.S.-Turkish relationship evolves in the coming years. But I think if you do have this climate of suspicion uh, that is very pervasive, uh, it's going to be very difficult in detail to do some of the things that you quite rightly point to as being useful. Um, so there is both a, a detailed piece to this, but also an atmospheric piece to this in terms of building trust. My own view is that, you know, we have not done nearly enough with Turkey outside the issue of the PKK, which has been important, beyond that on Iraq diplomacy generally. I mean, the Baker-Hamilton report pointed to the need to bring in partners. We debate heavily in Washington the wisdom of uh, making this a central issue with Iran, for example, if there was a detente with Iran. Uh, this re could require a revolution in American foreign policy. It doesn't require a revolution in American foreign policy to engage Turkey as a NATO ally on this question. So my point there is PKK plus other things. And then finally on this question of the envoy. Um, well, my, my reaction, you know, sort of half humor humorously was, was exactly the one we've heard already. Well, another envoy, you know. Uh, we have a few already. Um, but I understand the point that's being made about the utility. I would simply leave as an open question whether appointing, going down that road of appointing a special envoy is a coupling or decoupling, if I can use that term, in terms of integrating this issue within uh, the larger picture of U.S. Middle East policy. Uh, it may or it may not. 
maybe it's better to put it in the bureaucracy and do it actively and properly with the attention of the administration and so on. I, I don't know the answer to that. It's just, it seems to me an important open question. There are some others like getting Europe and the United States on the same page with this, which I won't uh, touch. But again, let me just end by congratulating you on a really a terrific analysis. Thank you. Do you want a few minutes to reply? Then I think we are going to uh, we are going to open it up. Uh, I'll take uh, the few questions at a time. Let me start back there, here, and here. This will be the first three. Uh, there should be a microphone coming your way. It's coming from there. And please, uh, all of you, identify yourselves. Uh, my name is David Phillips. I'm uh, on the faculty of Columbia University and the director of the Atlantic Council's New Turkey Initiative. All right, congratulations to you on a good report. I think we all agree that the two flashpoints for conflict are really uh, the Kirkuk question and uh, the PKK. Since there already is a constitutionally mandated arrangement for addressing Kirkuk, I'd like to pose a question to each of the panelists on the PKK matter. Uh, Kubat, you've uh, talked about your improved relations with Turkey. A year ago, when the 100,000 troops were massed on the Iraqi Kurdistan border, there was a lot of pressure on the KRG to do more. And you made certain commitments at the time. Could you enumerate those commitments, evaluate their implementation, and suggest additional commitments that could be made going forward? Ian, you talked about um, a DDR strategy for the PKK. And uh, you know, clearly, uh, that involves some process for addressing the enormous human, su human suffering of the 1990s. Uh, has the German Marshall Fund or other groups studied comparative truth and reconciliation processes? And of course, such a process would need to involve some kind of amnesty arrangement. So have you looked at stage amnesty arrangements and amnesty qualifications based on the degree of involvement of uh, PKK fighters. And then my question for Henri uh, has to do with uh, your recommendation for what you called U.S. intercession. There clearly has been uh, efforts in the past to have high-profile American diplomats or special envoys, usually with a security background, uh, work in Iraqi Kurdistan. How would you evaluate their success? Uh, if that is a negative evaluation, why have they failed? And would that U.S. Special Envoy have a broader regional mandate, focusing also on democratization and development issues for Turkey, which is indeed a root cause of the conflict? And if so, how could the Turks be assuaged that that, in fact, is not a step towards U.S. support for greater Kurdistan? Uh, Professor Phillips, you caught me by surprise, and I let you have three questions. I'm not going to continue letting everybody having three questions, or we'll never get through. Okay. There is a question over here. Uh, I wasn't. The microphone. Yeah. Uh, and your name, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aydin Selgen. I'm a counselor at the Turkish Embassy here in, uh, in D.C., in fact, Professor Phillips covered a few of my issues, my questions, but I would like to make a few brief comments, few sentences, if I may. First, uh, very briefly, uh, concerning the U.S.-Turkish relations through the Iraq perspective, now, the, uh, of course, after hitting rock bottom in 2003, now our uh, relations with Iraq uh, is, can be marketed here. In fact, I'm able to market those as a model of cooperation. This concerns both the KRG peace and uh, our relations with Baghdad in general. So I guess I understand that the report is a bit uh, uh, dated, as uh, Henri uh, suggested, but now is, uh, there is, this is not as a sticking point anymore in Turkish-US relations. This is one point. Secondly speaking, uh, the, uh, in the uh, approaching the Kurdish, so-called Kurdish issue uh, without taking into consideration the existence of the international borders and so on and so forth. I guess this, that we should make, a, as an approach in general, we should make a difference between the cultural issue, 
the counterterrorism issue, which by mean I mean PKK, and then the political relations between Turkey and Iraq. Uh, PKK is a terror organization, uh, and we have to be able to cooperate with the regional government and with with Baghdad uh, uh, to eradicate PKK. But this is not a, a, a question which should be, I guess, uh, put into the other general issue. My question would be, in addition to the, uh, I was going to ask also about the commitments and the counterterrorism aspect, but also I was going to ask, how do you think any of the uh, uh, of them can answer, but also especially Kubat, the energy aspect? How do you see the interplay of the uh, Baghdad government, regional government, uh, taking into consideration that the hydrocarbon law and the revenue sharing law is, uh, is being debated, and taking into consideration Turkish contribution to the passage of SOFA, uh, States of Force Agreement, and the provincial uh, elections law. Uh, how do you see the interplay between Ankara, Baghdad, and Erbil in the uh, in future, especially in, with the focus on energy issues? Thank you very much. Uh, let's start taking these because there are so many questions here, and you'll get the next one. <laughs> okay, uh, who wants? Okay, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll answer <coughs> David's question first, and I'll come on to Aydin's. Vis-a-vis um, -vis the, what the KRG has done um, to try to um, solve, not solve this issue, but, but work towards reducing the, 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 the tensions, uh, first and foremost, we, we made it absolutely clear that, that, that it is not our policy to have any group in our territory to attack any of our neighbors or to conduct activities in any of our neighboring countries from our territory. Now, that is a, that is a policy statement. The implementation of that policy statement was that, that what we did was we, we created a security belt um, around where the PKK are today in the Kurdistan region, which is um, in the Kandil mountain range, a, a very rugged mountain terrain area. Um, villages scattered along this, this area, but no real larger towns or cities. Um, we, we prevented our airports to be used by anyone affiliated or associated uh, with the PKK, and we were monitoring goods and, and traffic that was going up into the villages of the Kandil mountain range to make sure that there were no ammunitions or weapons going into that area. Um, we are obviously the, 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 the main official checkpoints and border crossings between Turkey and the KRG, we can monitor and, and control. Um, but the reality is um, the, the, the PKK is not just present in the Kurdistan region, but it also has a significant presence inside Turkey as well. All furthermore, they're also able to navigate the border with Iran and come into Turkey from Iran if they, if they chose to. So there are certain things that are outside of the control of um, the KRG, but we've done all that we can within our control um, to try to limit the the impact of the, the of the PKK on on Turkey. But w what's I think more important is that there is a, an understanding on all sides that this issue, this PKK issue, that is decades old, cannot be resolved militarily. Um, that there has to be a comprehensive and broad-ranging um, str str policy. Um, that is political in nature, that is economic in nature, that is social in nature, that may have some security components to it. Uh, but for so many years, the only topic on the table has been the military cooperation, if any were to, to exist. Now, um, there is an understanding, I think, on the U.S. side, on the KRG side, and even on, on the Turkish side, that there, this, this requires a far more sophisticated strategy, um, that, that 30 years of armed conflict between the two sides has not resulted in, in any success on anybody's side. Um, should I answer um, Aiden's question as well? Now? Yeah. Okay. Um, the issue of um, energy, I, th I think, has, um, again... A, can be a major contribu contributor to improved relationships between Turkey and Iraq, and in particular between Turkey and, and the Kurdistan region. Again, I express my frustrations at the slow pace of development um, on developing a national um, oil law and a national oil structure in, in, in Baghdad. Um, but I think there, there, there is uh, an understanding that the vast energy resources that we have 
in Iraq and in particular in, in the in the Kurdistan region can be beneficial to Turkey, can be beneficial to Europe. There is many things that, that, that we can discuss with the U.S., with Turkey, that is of a much greater strategic relevance and of geopolitical relevance that, that is, I think, beneficial to all sides. So um, continued engagement by Turkey with Baghdad um, on creating an, an oil law that is reflective of the constitution of the country, that is decentralized, that is not state-controlled, that is not a state monopoly, one that allows for international partnerships in the development of the natural resources sector of Iraq will be welcomed. Um, of course, engagement by the U.S. Um, on, this, uh, on this fact will be welcomed. It, but it will be welcomed as long as it's in accordance with what the country's constitution states. Um, on all of these issues that, that is outlined in this report, um, and that we highlight, highlighted as, as potential flashpoints. Um, they all revolve around a single issue, and that is what is the law of Iraq? What is the law of the land? We have a constitution in this country, and unless we come to an agreement on this constitution, none of these issues, hydrocarbons law, federalism, oil law, will, 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 will be addressed. So this is something to bear in mind as people are making recommendations, as policies are being formed. They have to be in, co in, in, in accordance to the nation's constitution. Um, otherwise, it will be rejected, and, and, and you know, we fought long and hard to have a constitution that is viable, um, and, and we uphold and respect this constitution. And as long as that is the case, then the Kurds will be full and willing partners in, in Iraq in, as we move forward. Yeah. Well, just uh, on David's question, um, well, first of all, David, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is an important issue. Uh, someone ought to be looking at this in detail, including the lessons learned from other cases on this amnesty and reconciliation set of issues. Uh, German Marshall Fund, to my knowledge, has never done that. Um, there may be others who have. Uh, certainly there is a body of analysis from other cases, from Northern Ireland. Uh, Algeria came to mind as you were uh, talking about this. Um, that might be worth uh, looking at. Um, I would just say, though, my own sense is that uh, that I think a lot of Turks, although this at some point that political piece of the of the um, of the issue of the strategy is going to become critical, and Turks already talk about this quite actively. I mean, even those who are focused very uh, specifically on the security dimension, the Turkish general staff talks even about the economic and political and so on dimensions. Although, you know, to <coughs> still to spin this out in terms of amnesty and so forth. Um, I'm not sure Turkey is quite there yet. Uh, eventually, you might get there. Um, it strikes me as the kind of thing that, at the end of the day, only Turks and Kurds can do for themselves. Um, I think it would be extremely difficult, other than the softest of sort of second-track NGO activity, uh, to get to envision either a, an American or a European role in that, however worthwhile it might be at some point in the future. Uh, <clears throat> David, your question about previous attempts at um, uh, U.S. envoys. The most important one is a guy called Joe Ralston, General Ralston, who was sent as, quote-unquote, as a PKK envoy. And I, never, I was never sure what it meant, but I think he didn't know what it meant either. So, um, and it was a very frustrating experience for him because he was very um, – his mandate was very restricted. He wanted to do more. He, uh, he actually thought very much in terms of looking at the issue beyond the PKK and looking at relations with the KRG, et cetera. But there was no backing. It was really – it was the Bush administration's way of buying some time uh, as the Turks were pressing um, the United States to do something about the PKK or allow the Turks to do cross-border operations and – the Bush administration came up with this envoy. That's not what I have in mind. If I, I don't call it an envoy, but a coordinator. But on a gen more general point of uh, amnesty and how – I mean, I do really believe that when you look at the PKK component of this, remember the Turkish army, which is the second largest army in NATO, has fought for 20 years against the PKK and has yet to get the best out of it. And, you know, these kinds of, you know, when you, when you have these kinds of insurgencies, and especially an insurgency that can cross borders and go, whether it's into Iran or Iraq, 
Um, it, they're very hard. They're very obviously very hard to de to defeat. Moreover, what the one thing that we we forget is that this insurgency has popular support in Turkey. And you know when you look when you talk to people and uh, you look at even uh, one of the Kurdish the legal Kurdish party. I mean, it clearly mm -hmm. there's sympathy for the insurgency at some level. And it seems to me on that's one aspect. The other aspect of the, of the coin is that people are also fed up of the insurgency in the southeast in Turkey. They now want – what they want is for a return of the – of what, when you talk to them, of the kids to go – they want the kids to come home, all those people who are in the mountains to come home. And somehow one has to construct a process by which – um, these people will be reintegrated. Maybe not all of them will be able to come back to Turkey. Certainly the leadership may have to learn Norwegian or Swedish or something like that. But, um, but and some of them may be only integrated into, in northern Iraq and will never be able to come back to Turkey. But at least for the, for the, for the conflict to end, you, you need to create conditions whereby there is an incentive for people to come down from the, from, from the mountains. Whether you call that an amnesty or a partial amnesty or a uh, the Turks had another euphemism for it, something uh, uh, winning people back to society. Uh, something has to, has, to, has to be done, and I think um, that is where the United States can be, can be influential because um, for the PKK, especially in Iraq, to disband, it has to be afraid of something, uh, and, and that is us. The one thing I also wanted to – I forgot to mention at the beginning of, um, of my talk – the other thing, the, the context, when you look at American decision to withdraw, and this applies to everything that I said, every day that goes by, our influence in Iraq diminishes. So in that sense, there is, if we are going to do something, we have to do it now. We better do it now than, rather than later when we have uh, less influence, so to say. Right? As we pull troops out, as we become less relevant to domestic political, um, as we should, to issues in Iraq, our influence diminishes, and we need to um, um, to take that. And in, to, just to answer Aydin's question on kind of looking at it without borders, this is not meant to say that the, you know because. I take out the borders for a moment and try to conceptualize the issue as a whole. That means that the borders should not – are open to be, to be changed. On the contrary, the, the main point that I make is that the most important issue is that Iraq should remain as a unified whole, that there should not be a separate Kurdish state uh, in, in, in Iraq. So nobody is talking about changing the boundaries, but it is also – uh, it, we, we will be deluding ourselves if we don't think that events in one area don't affect events on the other, don't think change the perceptions of governments and, and people, etc. Et and, um, and finally, on the point of the improvement on KRG Turkish relations, I, I acknowledge that in the, in, the, uh, in the paper, but I do worry about whether or not it's, uh, whether it is reversible or not. I think it is reversible. And I think it depends um, – I can – we can talk later, but I can create, give you a couple of scenarios in which it can be reversible. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to you. Uh, can, can we have a – the mame? We have – Uh, thanks. Uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report, although I should probably say to this crowd, perhaps not the Mitchell Report uh, you're thinking about. Um, <laughs> I, have two, uh, I have two quick uh, <clears throat> two quick questions that that are fairly specific, but uh, so let me let me say the, f the first one that, that uh, the comment that both Professor Barkey and Mr. Talibani made about the sort of silo mentality at the Department of State and bureaus not talking to each other. And my question is, could you give us a, an example of where that has been a problem in the past? Where, wh where has that happened and what did that prevent from happening or how did that, how did that um, uh, slow up progress? Let me get some sense of, uh, the spec of specificity there. And to Mr. Lesser, 
uh, I think you characterize the current state of the Turkish uh, KRG uh, relationship as sort of riding on cultural uh, wings, uh, if that's, no. and that the question is whether it will move upstream to become sort of geostrategic in nature. Could you give us an example of what uh, what what a geostrategic what, what would make what would make it a relationship based on uh, geostrategy, if you will, an example of sort of dimensionalize what it means to say there is now a geostrategic relationship. Uh, I I'll take uh, advantage of the prerogative of the chair and put in a question myself before we come to you. Uh, you, you have all mentioned the issue of Kirkuk and uh, you know the difficult the, the fact that the, uh, the constitution prescribes a referendum. The problem of uh, uh, sort of uh, not only figuring out what the sort of de gerrymandering is, uh, Henri put it, uh, the area and so on. But my question is: To what extent uh, is the issue of Kirkuk now going to be get entangled with the issue of the IDPs in the country more generally? Because you have. Uh, sort of the rules for Kirkuk, the constitution was written before this massive population displacement uh, that you have in the country. And is it still possible to insulate uh, the issue of Kirkuk from that of the return of other, of other IDPs inside the country? Because there are two more million people from, uh, from the estimates uh, that are now displaced. Thank you. And then we have one okay, there in the center. My name is Kani Zulam. I'm with the American Kurdish Information Network. I happen to be a Kurd from Turkey, Turkish Kurdistan. I was wondering if uh, one of you could, uh, would care to elaborate on the spectacle that took place in Davos, Switzerland. More specifically, I want to ask about the role of religion in politics, especially in Turkey, in Israel, and in Iran. If Erdogan and his ilk choose to become the champions of the Palestinians, can you see Israelis, Israeli politicians siding with the Kurds? If Iran acquires nuclear weapons and Israel decides to attack Tehran, is it possible to see the emergence of Kurdistan regional government in Iran? If peace, which happens to be the mission of this institution, cannot deliver Kurds their freedom, should Kurds then fan the flames of war? If they do, can you blame them? Um. On uh, the Mitchell report. This is going to go on the Mitchell report. Uh, first of all, the silo mentality is not just um, uh, specific to State Department. I would not want to. <clears throat> uh, it's also in the military. I mean, to give you a couple, two examples. On um, CENTCOM runs a war in, in Iraq, but Turkey belongs to UCOM. And when you look at the relationship between CENTCOM and Turkey, it's very, very bad. I mean, CENTCOM was very upset at the Turkish decision not to allow um, uh, troops to cross from the north, and I'm sure there are people who blame some of the initial, I mean, sorry, in, initial uh, uh, problems in Baghdad because there were not enough troops to the Turks. Uh, CENTCOM also uh, dealt very badly with the Turkish special forces. They arrested on July 4th, 2003. Now, admittedly, those, people, th those special forces were up to some, shall, let's put it this way, some no good uh, thing, but they, then they got the Al-Qaeda treatment, and this has really rankled, uh, has really had a huge impact on Turkish-American relations. I mean, this is one thing with Turks. Now, Yukon would not have done that. I mean, so there is a way. There's not enough information. There's not. Uh, and then similarly, uh, w when you look at the way state works, um, I, s I think um, uh, th there were many messages that were coming actually from from Turkey and from the Iraqi Kurds at one point, well before this rapprochement started, 
uh, that were completely missed because I don't think the two sides were talking to each other. At, at, uh, the people who, had, who produce, uh, who create policy for Turkey versus the people who produce policy on, on Iraq, uh, the Turkish ch chief of intelligence, Emre Taner, only you know probably with the prime minister's consent, but not with the consent at that time of the military or the presidency. Uh, went and started negotiating and talking to to the Iraqi Kurds. The Iraqi Kurds were telling us also that they wanted this. They, they were looking to us to 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 build on this, and we did absolutely nothing. Um, Marina on Kirkuk, I, I actually think that the IDP issue and Kirkuk are actually quite separate because the Kirkuk issue has been on the on the back burner for such a long time and people are um, the issue has been very, very crystallized between let's say the Turkmen and the Kurds and the Arabs and each one know knows which, where they want to go back to or if they want to leave etc i think those two are not going to be conflated finally on davos i mean we, it remains to be seen whether Davos is a, just a flash in the pan or it's going to be part of a longer policy process. I'm not sure at the moment. I think I'll just very, I think uh, Henri covered pretty well the, the, the Mitchell Report's um, concern. I, I think I'd second that. Um, on, I too would say that the issue of IDPs as a whole in Iraq um, should be separated from the issue of Kirkuk because the, what happened in Kirkuk and Khanakin and Sinjar, these were this was a forced displacement of, of communities. This was a policy carried out by the former regime. This was genocide um, in, the, in the form of ethnic cleansing um, that, that has to be reversed in, in a legal way. Now, we have the legal framework in place. It is the Constitution. There's an article of the Constitution that lays out the mechanisms um, to, to carry out that um, resettlement process and, and um, re-gerrymandering um, of, the, of the borders and ultimately coming up with a, with a, uh, a mechanism to have people to have a say on the future um, administrative status of places like Kirkuk and, and Khanakin. Um, so that has to be treated uh, in, in, a, in a unique way, um, and it is incredibly complicated. It is a very complex situation which raises the emotions of, of, of everybody involved. But um, the UN assistance mission in, in Iraq, um, Stefan Di Mastura, um, has done a pretty good job to date of, of gathering the facts, of, of making certain um, policy recommendations. But I think the time is now to get some heavyweight support for Di Mastura's effort um, in Washington to give it a policy context and not just a, a, a technical context. So we, d we should certainly treat them separately from the larger um, and regrettable IDP issue as a whole in, in Iraq. Well, just on this question of, um, of um, what would, how do you get to something that looks more like a strategic relationship between Turkey and the KRG? I mean, I would actually say that the center of gravity at the moment is not, in fact, cultural. If you leave aside the Kurdish community and the issue of affinity, that's different. But if you're talking about, you know, Ankara, KRG, I mean, the, really the core of this is economic at the moment. Um, so I would imagine looking ahead, a couple of things have to happen to actually get a strategic relationship. One is you have to have confidence that borders borders won't be changed. I mean, this is perhaps the, the Tur Turco-centric view of what's necessary, but I think it's, it's, it's true for all of that. Uh, you have to have confidence. Uh, secondly, I think there's probably a lot more that can be done on the economic side, including on infrastructure and investment and all the rest of it. The energy piece might be very big uh, in that part of it. And then finally, I suppose the two sides have to come to see each other as security partners rather than liabilities rather than risks, rather than a source of risk. Um, there are inklings of that already, but you're certainly not there yet, and you probably won't ever be there until the PKK issue is dealt with in some fairly definitive way. Um, on the question of, of uh, Prime Minister Erdogan and Davos and so on, well, I mean, I wouldn't go too far with all of this. I think I share Henri's view. To me, this, this incident tells us a couple of things. First of all, it tells us the personality matters in international relations, um, you know, uh, it really does. And I think uh, that we can spin out the implications of that and so on, but nonetheless, you know, he's the prime minister, he has a style of his own. Uh, we have other examples in the world of leaders with their own style for good or, or for bad and so on. I don't think that's necessarily so such a durable issue. It's not so much about Davos. If you're asking about uh, the Turkish public reaction to the Gaza 
crisis. Um, well, this also tells us things. I mean, public opinion counts in Turkey today. The Palestinian issue engages public opinion in a serious way in Turkey. This is a structural reality. Um, it's also a reality to say that over the last years under AKP, uh, the Middle East as a whole has become a more prominent piece of Turkish policy, that the AKP government is more comfortable in dealing with really all of its Middle Eastern partners than its predecessors might have been, would have been. Uh, that has implications for what we're talking about. But I, to me, the driver here is not Islamism. Uh, it's not that. It's, it's, it's um, perceptions of national interests and, yes, a mood of rising nationalism in the whole region. I don't think we have time for another round of the round of questions, but I'd like just to give a chance to the speakers for if they want to make any final concluding remarks. Ian? It's, it's, a, it's a great report, and thank you oh, <laughs> for it. <laughs> um, no, I'll, I'll just re reiterate the fact that they, there are certain, we don't need to recreate the wheel in certain issues. We have a constitution in the country. Um, we need to find a way of adhering and respecting this constitution, um, and we mustn't kind of ignore these, these critical um, issues in, in the country, such as the resolution of Article 140, such as the implementation of, of, of federalism uh, in the country, and, and also implementing the oil revenue sharing um, law and, and the, the oil framework law in the country. And that, you know, unfortunately, it looks like we still need a push um, from uh, be it the United States, be it um, others. We, we do need to push, to push, push us in this right direction. The U.S. cannot leave and disengage from Iraq um, unless these issues uh, are, are resolved? Um, the one thing I would like to add is um, Kubat brought up the issue of the Mistura, the UN Special Envoy. The UN Special Envoy, and you'll see in the, in the article it details it, has this essentially uh, three-stage process of trying to resolve the disputed territories and Kirkuk ultimately. And I think here the, certainly the Bush administration did not really back Mistura. I mean, was very receptive. I mean, was wanted this him to succeed. But for Mistura to succeed, even though it's the UN, he needs much more support. I mean, he has a staff of, I think, of 20 people. You're not going to be able to deal uh, with all these very, very complex issues with essentially what is, is in Iraq, at least, a weak international institution, the UN. So one of the things that the United States has to do, and I argue, is that the Demistura process has to be strengthened because this, is, this provides a, a long-term way out. And it's a stage-by-stage it's -stage process, which means that it also uh, envisage, envisages confidence-building measures and, and reconciliation between the communities. And that will be critical. Ultimately, maybe Kirkuk will be We'll see it to the Kirkuks. We'll see the province of Kirkuk and we'll see the city of Kirkuk, each being dealt, dealt with differently. There are many different ways of, of resolving these issues. But again, you know, my emphasis here was about getting the Americans involved in large part because the details, as you will see, are, are quite numerous. And there is nobody else out there uh, that can actually engage in this. Thank you.